welcome. First of all, welcome. This is Unsolicited Perspectives. I'm Bruce Anthony, your host here to lead the conversation in important events and topics that are shaping today's society. Join the conversation by following us wherever you get your audio podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch our video podcast. Rate, review, like, comment, share. Share with your friends, share with your family, hell, even share with your enemies. On today's episode, I'm going to be interviewing Jason Johnson. He's a writer, director, producer of films. He even worked with Francis Ford Coppola. We're going to be talking to him today, but that's enough of the intro. Let's get to the show. So ladies and gentlemen, like I said at the top, I've got Jason Johnson here. He's a writer, director, producer, currently working at Strike 5 Films. We're going to be talking about his background, his passion, his future. Also, he worked with Francis uh, Francis Ford Coppola, so I'm really excited to get more information about that. But Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, It's my pleasure. And I start off every interview with... Tell me a little bit about your background. Where did it all begin? Uh, I'm originally from the Chicago suburbs. Um, I uh, came out to California pr- right after I uh, finished college. Mm-hmm. Just, uh, you know, I started working for Francis Coppola, as you were saying earlier. And then, you know, just the rest is history. Um, but yeah, it's just, uh, I'm just a kid from Chicago that loved films and just uh, loved being creative and uh, just you don't want to enter into this uh, fantastic entertainment industry. Okay. So you always loved films uh, as a kid. Was it just something that you enjoyed doing or did you notice as a kid, I want to do that? I think I just loved films. Uh, You know, I used to watch like Eddie Murphy and, you know, my mom would watch soap operas and I just was just really captivated by just the, the magic, you know, behind what went into it, you know, and, and I think growing up for me, it was something that it just seemed like it was on screen and I didn't even know how that even worked, you know, Mm -hmm. how you even enter into that industry. So, um, it was just something that really wasn't of interest and I just always wanted to be a part of it. I just didn't know Mm -hmm. how. Just didn't know how, um, did you go to school for film? No, I actually went to, uh, I went to a four-year university and they had a radio, TV, and film department. Mm -hmm. And that was more tailored for like the uh, nightly news. Uh, But, you know, after like working in the camera, the VTR, doing uh, technical direction, I figured that, you know, maybe I could put some creativity into some of the things I was doing. So anytime we had like a project, I would always try to put a narrative spin on it instead of, you know, just the uh, information spin that they wanted for like, you know, t- uh, news TV. Yeah. I got in trouble with that in college. I wrote for the school newspaper and I wanted to be a columnist. And sometimes journalism is just giving out the facts, but I always wanted to put my opinion into it. So that's interesting that there's those parallels. What made you, okay. So you didn't go to school originally for it. How did you get interested with joining the program while you were at school? Uh, realistically, <laughs> this is probably the, the worst way to pick a major. But I remember graduating and then going to college, not knowing what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And then I went into kind of what they have, like the orientation room. And, and everyone was all of the uh, college uh, deans were like wearing neckties. They all Mm -hmm. seem to be wearing black suits, neckties, blue suits, blue blue neckties. But way in the back, there was a guy that was wearing like a red bow tie. So I said, yo, whatever you're teaching, that's what I want to do. Because Mm -hmm. it just didn't seem like it was anything that was just mundane. So Mm -hmm. uh, a a risky bet. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Probably very reckless. But that happened to be uh, speech communication. And, uh, you know, I just jumped uh, feet first into it and then just said, this is going to be my path. And and some way, somehow it's going to work. So let's go a little bit further back into your background. You say you're from the suburbs of Chicago. What were the economics? What was your family like? Did did any of that kind of push you towards what you're in right now as far as entertainment? No, it's it's really interesting because my parents are not, I wouldn't say that they're really creative. My dad was a truck driver. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, my mom worked at AT AT&T in the factory. So it, it wasn't really like, you know, I had like this uh, creative upbringing, you know, but we would watch a lot of TV and and movies and stuff like that. Um, so I just, you know, I, I don't know. I just kind of gravitated towards drawing when I was early, uh, in, in my uh, lifetime, I actually wrote comics for my school newspaper as well. Okay. So it's just, uh, I think that's where the desire to tell stories and try to be creative. That's where that was all birthed out of. But yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I didn't come from a creative upbringing. It's just, uh, it's just circumstance of just, that's what grabbed me. And, and I just kind of developed it. Now, I have uh, an interesting question about your parents, because I know that my parents have always kind of uh, encouraged me and my siblings to think outside of the box and to try different things, um, but to also have a backup plan. So originally, I wanted to be a writer. Uh, but my father also said, you know, maybe you want to get a business degree or something like that. So when you tell your parents that you're majoring in speech communications, what are they saying to you? Are they saying that's not something that you can make a career out of? Or are they encouraging you? You know, I think for them, it was just important that we went to college and that, you know, we graduated. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm uh, outside of my older brother. I'm the second one in my uh, entire family to go to college. So. I think that they were just uh, really keen on me going to college and graduating. Uh, I don't think that they have the information of, you know, you should do this because it's going to provide you this opportunity. Mm. Uh, So they didn't really have a lot of input, but they they did make it uh, clear to me that they did want me to graduate and try to do my best. So that was really their only direction. Okay, Um, so you didn't really get influences uh, from entertainment from your parents. But as you're working in this new station and, and coming up with narratives and creativity, um, you graduate. And somewhere along the line, you start working with the famed director, Francis Ford Coppola. Can you tell me the story of how that all came about? Yeah. So uh, growing up in uh Chicago land. I, I went to Eastern Illinois University, which is in Southern Illinois. And um, after college, still didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, had these communication skills and ability to uh, know a little bit about film industry and, and uh, doing stuff for the news. So I followed a girl out to California, which didn't work out. <laughs> it did work out. It, it did, did work, work out. out. Yeah, it, it, it got it, me it, here. <laughs> it got you there. The situation yeah. didn't work out, but it brought you to <laughs> what your future would be. Yeah. Uh, so I remember getting out here. We moved to Napa, California, which is there's just no black people, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I remember just applying for, you know, sending out my resume to this place and that place. I must have sent out a hundred resumes. Mm-hmm. And the only place that called was like, um, you know, this uh, nondescript winery. And they didn't say, yo, this is Francis Ford Coppola. They just said, can you come in for an interview? Mm-hmm. So um, I remember going to the interview. They asked me a lot of questions about um, what's your availability? What do you know about wine? And I'm just thinking, you know, I don't even know what I apply for, you know, to tell you the truth. <laughs> OK. All right. Uh, so. So finally, they, they offered me a job. I didn't have a job. So I said, OK, I'll take it. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then they said, OK, well, welcome to Francis. Uh, it was actually called Nibom Coppola at the time. And okay. it still didn't register what it was, you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, it wasn't until I got my orientation that, oh, this is this is Francis Ford Coppola's winery. Right. Uh, so, you know, I started working there and I was a wine steward for, I want to say, three months over the summer. Okay. Mm-hmm. Was terrible at it. Didn't know anything about wine, you know, uh-huh. just telling people any old thing. They were just like, let me get some Merlot I, I, or I pour them like some Chardonnay. And it's just like, oh, Jesus, that's yeah. completely different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's safe to say that you were not good at this job. No, it was terrible at okay. this job. Okay, okay, and right, I'm surprised right. I didn't get fired. But uh-huh. at, the, at the end of the summer, you know, because they just needed bodies because, you know, mm-hmm. uh, people would show up and there'd just be waves of people. Mm-hmm. And um, at the end of the summer, they said, uh, yo, do you want to work in a different de- department? And that was that was a way for them to say, we like your we like you as a person, 
but you know, this is not, this is not for you. Right. So, uh, that happened to be, I, I worked in a warehouse for another couple months and then I would make like these cardboard sculptures, which mm-hmm. caught the eye of the art director. Mm-hmm. And then he said, yo, do you want to work, uh, in our creative marketing team? So when you were making these cardboard sculptures, you were doing it for the company or were you just, this is just extra cardboard. I'm just going to do this because I, I need to fill my create uh, my creative artistic side. Yeah. I was just doing creative outlets because, you know, there'd be times where, you know, it's, you know, it's busy and then it's not. So, you know, just to, just to have a creative outlet, I just started doing it just out of instinct. You know, I just wanted to do something that just appealed to my creativity. And, and, um, and that caught the you said the creative director's eye yeah he he happened to be going back there for some wine because you know they they had to pick up wine and you know like uh ship it off to somewhere and do presentations Mm -hmm. and then he 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 stopped and he said who made this and i said oh my god i'm in trouble now yeah i'm really in trouble (laughs) and and he was just like wow that's really creative i didn't even think that you could do that out of cardboard Mm -hmm. and uh you know, he, uh, I just started talking to him and we, we, we formed a friendship. And then from there, you know, I started, you know, voicing my opinion on some things that I thought they could do. And then before mm-hmm. I knew it, I, I got to work for their creative marketing team. And what were some of these opinions? Uh, what, what did you see that you were like, ah, maybe you could do this a little bit differently and, or this is how I would do it. And what gave you the balls to do that? You know, uh, I'll start with what gave me the balls. It's just like <laughs> when you are somewhere where you just you don't feel like you're doing your life's you know work or just you know your passion. Mm-hmm. Then it's just like whatever you know you're gonna just try whatever you're gonna throw whatever against the wall. Uh, so I think that that gave me an opportunity to just be bold. You know, if mm-hmm. I if I got let go, then at least I was doing what you know my heart told me to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but. You know, I wanted to, I thought of wine as something that was really stuffy and it's just like all the bottles are the same. So, you know, I just say, well, what if you can put stuff in a different bottle, different shapes, you know, and and they'd explain to me, well, you can't do it because of X, Y, Z, but Mm -hmm. you know, at least I was getting those ideas out there. Um, Mm -hmm. so, you know, interestingly enough, they started, uh, it wasn't because of me, but you know, maybe, maybe I had a little bit to do with it, but uh, they started putting stuff in cans. They started putting it, uh, you know, uh, in different shaped bottles instead of just kind of the standard that you see. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, I, I think some of that was uh, appealing just to look at things from a different way because, you know, someone that's a non-traditional wine drinker is saying, yo, if you want to bring in other people that are, you know, not traditional wine drinkers, then maybe that's something that they might be interested in. You had a different set of eyes because they were in a bubble and, and, and they're consuming it because they're wine enthusiasts. And you're saying, well, I'm not. But if you want to attract people like me, here's some ways to do it. And that caught their attention. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. that was that was I think that was interesting to them. And just, uh, you know, they give me a chance. So as you're continuing on giving out suggestions, where does this lead to? Uh, Francis Ford Coppola and him specifically saying to you, go out and become famous. So we did what was called um, a road show. He was uh, introducing a new line of wine. And this was mm-hmm. kind of like a, a family wine that he uh, was close to his heart and he wanted to kind of get it out there. So we were going to do a, um, I want to say a 13 city tour where he would kind of do magic tricks and, um, uh, things that would kind of promote the wine in a non-traditional way. Hold on. And I, I got to ask you, Francis Ford Coppola does magic tricks. Yes, he does. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. It's just so, a, that was just a quick aside, but continue on. <laughs> <laughs> so going back to my ability to uh, make things out of untraditional media, like cardboard and such, they hired me as a prop master. I'd never done oh. this before. Uh, and some of the things that we would do would be like a, a little wine bottle or I'm sorry, a little hot sauce bottle that blew flames out. So I had to figure out how to make that. Um, I made like a little rolling hut. Uh, you know, we had like these, uh, you know, magic tricks where, you know, he'd put like 
a small card in and into this box and then a big card would come out. So I, I was in charge of making all those things and storing them from city to city. And um, towards the end of it, he could so, see that when I was on stage, that I was really eating up that audience, you know, just <laughs> putting my best Colgate smile out. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that he said, I think he was just like, wait a minute, this guy is really attracted to this is, do you want to be famous? And I remember he asked me that and I didn't know what to say because I was like, Oh my God, this is a Francis Ford Coppola. I, I grew up watching this guy's movies. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting was, um, I didn't know what to say. So I just said yes, because I thought that's what he wanted me to say. Hmm. And as soon as I said that the biggest frown came on this guy's you know face mm -hmm. because he's very anti Hollywood. Yes, you know, a lot of people don't is. know that, but I, I didn't know that. So it's just like, you know, he kind of frowned at that. Uh, but, you know, he gave me the opportunity to work in his uh, film festival after that. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where I started to get the confidence that, yo, I can do this because I got this um, kind of this this vouch from this really famous director that's just hyper talented and hyper creative. So I just felt like, you know, if he could see it, then other people would see it. OK. So where did that lead you? Because you're working with him in the film festival, but then you go on to write, direct, and produce uh, award-winning content for various networks and brands. So how does that transition happen? What were, what were the steps in between those two situations? So I worked there for four years. And at the end of those four years, I felt like a really tiny fish in a really tiny pond you know i just felt like mm -hmm. you know i wasn't gonna get um i wasn't gonna get promoted to you know the, the next level um i felt that i wasn't really doing my films so i took a chance on myself and i just i left and i took a job teaching um i took a job as a creative director at the chamber of commerce um they, for whatever reason, thought that I knew Illustrator, Photoshop, InDesign. I, I totally didn't know it. But so they this said, is, once again, another job. Because, because you've, risked, you've reeled all three jobs here. The wine job that you didn't know anything about. You were a prop master. And, and, I, and I didn't get a chance to ask you, how did you figure all of that stuff out? And then you had to teach yourself um, basically the production aspect of... Um, eh, everything really, uh, Photoshop, this is media, digital, uh, stuff that you don't have a background in, correct? Yeah. So another job that you've taken that you don't have a background in, how are you teaching yourself to do all of these things? What tools are you using to get the job done? Uh, two words, God and Google. <laughs> that's, <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> and, and that's what, that's what I was doing. So, you know, I would, uh, you know. I, I was, I'm a Christian. I, I believe that, you know, I always put my faith and my dreams and desires in God's hands. And, uh, there was YouTube and there's Google. So there's yeah. like a wealth of information online. Mm -hmm. So, you know, somehow while they were giving me these jobs, I would say, okay, I can do it. Uh, little to know, little known to them. I couldn't do it, but right. I'm going to, I'm going to figure it out. So that's, uh, what I would do. Uh, I would make something that was rudimentary and then try to, you know, improve upon it over time until mm -hmm. I got really good at it. And, right. and, you know, uh, once I was good at Photoshop and illustrator and design, then, um, I started to learn, um, editing. Hmm. And then they started giving me like, you know, little editing jobs for the you know, chamber of commerce. Uh, so, you know, I made their, uh, annual, um, chamber video, which was a really good success. Okay. And then, and then after that I said, okay, well, I think I can teach this now. Hmm. <laughs> so, uh, so you're essentially self-taught. Yeah. So yeah. I, I went to uh, Napa college at the time and, uh, I started teaching, uh, video production. Hmm. And while I was learning because they had a lab that, you know, the students were required to be in, five or six hours a week, I was just in there, you know, I'd stay in there till like three o'clock in the morning, just learning, just trying stuff, just, you know, 
making like little special effects and just little little uh, snippet videos, just whatever you just whatever you can think of. And it started off bad at first, but you know they started to improve and get better and more glossy as I went on. Okay, uh, I want to rewind a little bit because you made a point and that that I didn't get a chance to really examine. You're a black man, and you go to Napa. What was that like for you doing all of these different jobs, doing all these different transitions from wine to film festival to chamber of commerce to teaching? What was it like for you being a black man in predominantly white spaces as you're teaching yourself how to do all of these things? Um, I, I gotta be honest. I didn't really think about it that much. You know, mm-hmm. I just thought, you know, I, I feel like I have a certain level of intelligence. I'm going to uh, show up. I'm going to do my best. And if I'm not given an opportunity and, you know, this is like 2020, I'm sorry, 2004 or something like that. Okay. Uh, then that's their problem. It's not mine. So, mm-hmm. you know, I would just try to put my best face forward, my best effort forward. And then I would let that be the determiner. But I don't feel as if it really uh, played a factor. Okay. Okay. Um, so you're working with the chamber of commerce, you move on to teaching, you're learning all of these special skills. How are you putting all of these skills together to transition to independent filmmaking? <laughs> you're, so you're, you're going to love this because this is, this is a common th- uh, thread here. So after, uh, Figuring out that I couldn't really progress in my film production uh, anymore at Napa College, mm-hmm. I left and became a uh, independent filmmaker, uh, just a okay. contractor. So you go out on these gigs and uh, you figure out, uh, you know, what they're doing. And at first, they hired me as a production assistant, which was kind of like the lowest of the low. You know, go get coffee. You know, move this. Stand here. Um, and I, I really wasn't feeling that because at that time I was just like, yo, I worked for the, I worked for the Godfather at this point. Right. So I rebranded myself as a location scout. And and these are the people that say they go out and they find a location to film at the crew comes in, you know, there's, uh, you know, restaurant services, you know, <laughs> where are the bathrooms and, you know, they figure out all the paperwork. Mm-hmm. So I said, I'm a location scout. And I'm, I'm here to uh, work uh, for you guys, and I'm going to do you one even better. I'm going to do it for $100 less than, you know, the other, these other location guys are doing. So so much to my surprise, they hired me again. Uh-huh. <laughs> and let me guess, never been a location scout. Never been a location scout, yeah. <laughs> and this, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy, uh, he, was, he was the... Um, he branded himself as the king of locations in the San Francisco Bay Area. Okay. And he he would just, you know, gobble these things up. He, he'd be like triple, you know, quadruple booked. So he said, I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to give you this Facebook gig and you have one day to to find it. Mm-hmm. So and it was just a really particular location where it was a second story um, apartment that's overlooking the street. and um, I, you know, I had to find it in one day okay. and I remember seeing this location just, you know, just, uh, just through, you know, normal life, just passing it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I, I just by chance went to this building, said, Hey, I'm going to offer you this amount of money. Didn't even know how much I was supposed to offer. Cause you know, they <laughs> can tell you, right. but it, it sounded good to them. So I booked it that day, you know, mm-hmm. so it was just like, so I came back to this guy I said, you know, I think I have it, but if you could give me a couple of days more, then I'll really have it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I started, you know, I used that time to figure out what are some other alternatives that they could uh, be. And I, I made sure that those locations weren't as good as this location. Right. Uh, so, so when they finally saw it, when the client side, uh, Facebook saw it, they said, oh my God, this is, this is exactly what we want. So from the strength off of that, you know, I started getting others. Right. So, so yeah, so that's, that's how I did it. Yeah. And so how do you transition from a location scout to you writing, directing 
and producing? So I think with, with locations, you could either go into uh, film production one or two ways. You can either go through uh, the, the financial route where you're managing all the money or you can do it through locations. Mm-hmm. And since I pegged locations and figured out how to do that, I, I started to have the confidence that, you know, well, maybe I can do this myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and at that time I was meeting a lot of different filmmakers, uh, you know, um, DPs, actors, so forth and so on. Uh, so I said, let me just try writing this little short, you know, it's just not anything that's, you know, really great, but let me just see if I can do it. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I, I was able to write, uh, I actually did a black exploitation film called black Rogers Okay. And, uh, you know, I was, I was the lead actor and, you know, uh-huh. it was ridiculous, you know, premise, but, uh, people actually showed up because they thought that I knew what I was doing. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> hey, sometimes you have to fake it until you make it. I'm really good at that. I'm, I'm so good at that. <laughs> and, and I got to, to all the listeners. It's true. Just, if you don't know what you're doing, just go ahead and keep doing it because eventually you're going to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what I did. So, you know, uh, I'd, sh- I'd show up on set. Um, I would, uh, you know, say this is what I would like to do. Um, and we'd have a little bit of conversation. And, um, you know, that's how we, we made the first uh, my first short film. Hey there, podcast listeners. It's Bruce Anthony here. And welcome to another episode of Unsolicited Perspectives. Today, I want to talk to you about something that's been on my mind lately, the importance of staying hydrated and taking care of ourselves. Whether it's prioritizing our health and wellness or gearing up for festival seasons or just gearing up for whatever season or time of year, there's one brand that's been my go-to for all things hydration, Liquid IV. Speaking of health and wellness, let's dive into how Liquid IV can fuel your well-being. Imagine starting your day off right, feeling refreshed and energized. Liquid IV Hydration Multiplier is the missing piece in your daily routine. With just one stick, you get five essential vitamins and two times faster hydration than water alone. It's perfect for those early mornings, pre-workout boosts, moments when you're just feeling run down, or even after a late night or long flights. I absolutely love how convenient Liquid IV is. The packaging makes it easy to bring with me wherever I go. And let me tell you, it's become vital daily part of my routine. The flavors, (laughs) let me tell you something, they're incredible. From refreshing sea berry and strawberry lemonade to classics like lemon lime and watermelon, there's a flavor for every preference. It's like a burst of hydration with a hint of deliciousness. Picture this. One stick of liquid IV mixed in 16 ounces of water, hydrating you two times faster and more efficient than water alone. And with 12 mouth water and flavors, you'll never get bored with your hydration routine. Plus, liquid IV is packed with five essential vitamins, B3, B5, B6, B12, and of course, vitamin C. It's also made with premium ingredients, non-GMO, free of gluten, dairy, and soy. This is hydration at its finest, but it doesn't stop there. Liquid IV believes that access to clean and abundant water is the foundation of a healthier world. That's why they partner with leading organizations finding innovative solutions to help communities protect both their water and their futures. It's incredible to know that Liquid IV has already donated over 39 million servings in 50 plus countries around the world. They truly walk the talk. Get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code unsolicited at checkout. That's 20% off anything you order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code unsolicited at liquidiv.com. Remember, folks, taking care of ourselves should always be a priority. So why wait? Head over to liquidiv.com, pick your favorite flavors, and experience hydration like never before. Stay refreshed, stay hydrated and keep rocking those unsolicited perspectives. Okay, Jason, so right now you're a writer, producer, and director for Strike 5 Films. Can you tell me a little bit about everything that you do and for Strike 5 Films and what is Strike 5 Films' brand? What What are they synonymous for? Uh, so let's start off with uh, what what is it synonymous for? What does it mean? So Strike Five is just uh, 
it is an analogy for uh, perseverance. You know, in, in life, you know, they say you get three strikes and you're out. Mm-hmm. But anyone that's ever done their passion, you know, they've got to strike out a million times, you know. So yeah. uh, I, I use the tally mark as, you know, well, that's, that's strike five. So let's go on to the next one. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's that's what that really was uh, born out of is uh, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to keep going. And, you know, through all these strikes, we're going to get there. You were going to figure it out. Yep. Yeah. And so uh, that's that's kind of what Strike Five was born out of. And uh, even before I, I um, really got my voice as far as writing, directing, et cetera, um, Strike Five was just kind of like my, you know, my my company where I would kind of loan myself as a, a producer mm-hmm. because that was the next logical step. Uh, but, you know, again, I didn't know anything about producing. I remember I was. I lied to get my first producer job. I said, have you done this before? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. I've done Never it. Never done it. I've done it. Yeah. And it was, it happened to be for a Bollywood film, which mm-hmm. was really interesting because they operate off of the cast system. So, you know, if, oh, you're, if okay. you're light, you know, then that puts you in a uh, voice of authority. But, you know, the darker you are, then it's supposed to mean that you're kind of, you know, lower. So, mm. so they hired me, uh, interestingly enough. And I didn't know anything about producing. So hmm. my plan was I would show up on set and I'd say, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. And what are you doing here? And then they would, they would all <laughs> scramble. And then I said, okay, you know, and then I get on Google again and, and then I'd watch. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's how I was just like, you know, we would, we would uh, produce stuff. And so it was I, just. So I have a question. As you're learning how to produce, it seems like a lot of the things that you've done have led to producing. Did you find producing was relatively easy or easier than it would have been because you had a background of really producing your own work going all the way back to the cardboard cutouts? Yeah, I think for me, um, producing is just uh, you have you have these people, you have these resources and then you have this time. So you mm-hmm. want to maximize all of those, you know, in, in the uh, in the time frame that you got. So right. that's to me, that's producing in a nutshell. Uh, you just mm-hmm. want to try to, uh, you know, keep everyone happy. Uh, you want to get uh, high performance out of everyone and just you want to make sure that, you know, everyone's safe. So uh, that's that's really how I approach producing. And, uh, you know, that's been pretty successful uh, so far. I, I continue to use the same model, even even from the days I didn't even know anything. So we're going back to you uh, scaring everybody away. You're getting on Google to learn how to produce. How did that? How did your producing evolve over this time? Um, really interesting because you know, first didn't know what I was doing, and we'd show up and and. Um, uh, over time, we got to go to more complex settings. And mm-hmm. sometimes it, it wasn't always roses. I remember we needed a college to film at. And mm-hmm. they. I remember the executive director said, Jason, we need a college to film at. We are running low on money. What can you do? So I said, let's go to Cal Berkeley. You know, that's an iconic college. And they said, whoa, 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 how are you going to do that? And I said, well, we're going to put We're going to have everyone wear Cal Berkeley shirts and we're going to act like we're students. Um, And so that's what we did uh, until the security showed up. And y'all were guerrilla style filming. Yeah, we're we're guerrilla style (laughs) filming on Cal Berkeley. And it was working perfect (laughs) until the security started to notice some things like some of our crew members were 50 years old. And like, that that sounds like a student. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> now there are boomers that do go back to school but it is a little unusual yes yeah it it kind of you know uh because you know like in chicago you know you can do things and you can kind of get away with it because no one's really paying attention and mm-hmm. that's kind of what my thought process was nobody really pays attention to anyone until they do mm-hmm. but in this case the security you know they're riding around on a golf cart, they pass, passed again. And then they said, wait a minute, this doesn't pass the smell test. Mm -hmm. What are all of these uh, kids wearing the same exact Cal Berkeley shirts doing in this small quarter? They haven't moved for a certain amount of time. 
And yo, some of these guys are 50 years old. <laughs> right. So then they stopped mm -hmm. and they said, who's in charge here? And um, they, they all pointed at me. And then they said, uh, Jason is. Mm -hmm. And this is where this is where the, the black man instinct uh, uh, totally came out in front of me. I said, oh, shit. I'm in trouble now. So my instinct was I took off running. <laughs> well, okay, you're the producer. You're guerrilla style filming. Security comes, you take off. I took off. I took okay. off running, yeah. And uh if you're I don't know if you're familiar with Cal Berkeley, but it's it's uh it's real near the city of Berkeley. So okay. right across the street is, you know, Berkeley proper. So in my mind, I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to jail, you know, because that's, you know, it's just like, you know, black man, he's supposed to be doing this. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to run, I'm going to disappear into city, you know, Berkeley. Okay. And then, you know, maybe they're going to be so wound up chasing me that they can finish filming. And that's exactly what happened. Wow. Yeah. But, uh, okay. So <laughs> were you guys able to use that footage because you have Berkeley's it, aren't there some copyright issues with that or am I mistaken? Cause I don't really know the film industry like that. Um, I think they were able to use all the footage, uh, okay. because, uh, you know, they called me like an hour later and they said, yo, you, you have to come back. And I said, <laughs> I'm not coming back if I get arrested. And they were like, no, no, no. We, we talked to them. It's cool. You know, we, we pulled a fast <laughs> one on them and they're just, okay. they just, they're just willing to just say, okay, you, you got mm. away with it, but they want to make sure that, you know, everything's copacetic. So okay. then, you know, I, I came back and said, hey, I'm sorry, but, you know, it's just we're just trying to make something out of nothing, you know, a dollar out of 15 cents. And right. And, you know, they uh, they let us go. But, you know, we, under the stipulation that we, we can never come back and do that again. I can understand that. So th was this when you were just being hired as a producer for Strike Five Films or is this when you were employed by them? So uh, Strike Five Films is my company. Um, okay. So you know, whenever you work as an independent contractor, you you kind of form like this uh, <laughs> dummy corporation that you work under, so you can get checks. Uh, so that's what I did. Um, so I was a producer for Strike Five Films that would loan my services out to other production companies. Got you. Got you. Got you. Got you. All right. So you finished that production. What happened when uh, you ran and you came back? What happened with those people that you were working with? Were they turned off? Were they impressed? Have you worked with them again since then? Oh yeah, they they said, "Oh my God, you're you're the best producer alive." You know, I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't believe this. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, from that project, they um, the executive director had a friend that just so happened to be making another film in Kansas City. So I went from that film to the next film, hmm. and and you know, just based off of what I learned from you know this project, I applied the you know the same thing. Uh, to this one, except it was in Kansas City. Mm. So, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So you've been doing this now. Uh, the film festival with Francis Ford Coppola was in, you said, 04? Yep. So 20 years. You've been doing this for 20 years. Mm -hmm. How has technology, technology has obviously changed in the last 20 years, but how has the change in technology benefited or caused issues with your work? Um, I think I, I'm one that I never really get afraid of technology. I think it's a mm -hmm. tool. So, uh, it's really been great to turn stuff around quickly. So, mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, nonlinear editing, kind of like what we have, everything is digital. So, you know, I think that makes it easier. Um, being able to have low light cameras makes it, uh, gives you the ability not to have as much lights. Um, but you know, now where AI is, is, uh, kind of taking uh, form, you can do whole scenes now, you know, just, mm -hmm. uh, type, uh, something in and then it's able to generate, you know, something that's just unbelievable. Right. So I think technology is going to be a, a big driver. I, I do think that there's going to be, uh, some people that kind of get, uh, 
you know, kicked out because, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's something that you really have to be on your A game to, to match that technology. But I, I think it's going to be a good thing moving forward. So I read an article, I don't know, a couple of months back with the issues with sound. So basically the article was saying a lot of people turn on subtitles um, when they're watching TV or movies because they can't hear. Them. Some of it has to do with the fact that we are got headphones on and we have sound that's really close to our ears. It's kind of damaging the ability for us to hear, but also because mics that are being used were completely different than what they were back in the day. And the sound editing is completely different from back in the day. Um, have you noticed uh, a, a downgrade in the audio or have you not noticed uh, or is that not really the case? I, I haven't really noticed uh, when it comes to sound, I really rely on sound mixers to kind of give me the, uh, give it, to me from the horse's mouth mm -hmm. uh, but i haven't really had any instance where they said well you know this new new you know microphone or or technique is limiting our ability to capture clean sound mm -hmm. um i'd, I'd want to say it might even be better because you know it's just uh uh with some some of these ai filters you can put something that's really scrambled in there and mm -hmm. then it's able to pinpoint you know things that you don't want and then to take it out. So um, I haven't really noticed it, uh, but you know, uh, I, I don't know if I would be the best person to ask. Yeah, no, the, um, and how has, AI is such a really, really interesting tool. Um, and I know during the negotiations this summer between SAG and the Writers Association with the uh, major companies, AI was a really big issue, especially for writers. So when you say you put in something in AI and it spits out something really dope, are you putting a premise or are you saying clean up what I have, add a little bit more humor, and then you're you taking that as, okay, now I'm going to put my own little flavor in it? Yeah, I, for, for me, when it comes to writing, you know, I'll, I'll generally have my own concept that I originally thought of mm -hmm. and then I'll write it, uh, to the best of my ability. And I would say that 90% of the stuff that I write, that's what I'm going to use. Uh, mm -hmm. but I do see where AI is really great where you could say, Hey, clean this up or, you know, analyze this. Does this make sense to the, you know, three structure arc? And, mm -hmm. you know, it'll give you that feedback and then you can say, Oh, okay, well, AI thinks that, you know, I'm missing this component. So then, you know, we go back and write. Um, I do notice that there's a lot of stuff that's uh, really generic that is, you know, that you watch on like Netflix or, you know, streaming mm -hmm. that I, I would, I would say there's probably AI generated because, you know, mm. it's, it's very milk toast in the way that it was produced, the way it was made, and, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, that I, I kind of frown against because, you know, you really want to have that human uh, connection because that's why mm -hmm. we're all watching a film. You want to, right. how do I relate to this character? How do I relate to this story? And I don't know if AI can do that quite yet. That's interesting because one of my favorite movie series is the Christopher Nolan uh, Batman series. Yes. And, um, Dark Knight Rises, the last one, has major plot holes. And I, that's interesting that you can say to AI, does this fall into, you said the three-act structure? Mm -hmm. And does it all make sense? Because AI can help you fill the plot holes that, that maybe filmmakers or writers or producers don't see. And I never even really thought about that. Yeah, that's interesting because I, I watched a video on all the plot holes in The Dark Knight, uh, you know, the bank robbery. And they uh -huh. were saying this is the worst bank robbery idea conceived, you know, because <laughs> all, every, everything has to happen perfectly for it to be executed. But mm -hmm. somehow it all works. And in real life, yeah. you know, that's, that's just not going to work out. But, yeah, I, I think AI is a good tool to kind of point those things out just, you know. Because sometimes you're so close to something that you just you're not looking at it with fresh eyes. 
So, you know, it's good to have that as a tool, but, you know, once it takes over and just starts to write and generate images and audio, then I, I don't know what, what, what are we, what are we doing? We're in the matrix now. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting. It is. Okay. So where do you see for yourself and strike five films for the future? Uh, so I want to make a uh, feature film. Uh, I've made nine short films that have been into, I want to say, 86 or 87 film festivals. We won six mm. times. Congratulations. And, thank you. And while that's great, it doesn't it doesn't move the needle because a short film is like a business card. This is what I can do, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I really need to make a short, uh, I'm sorry, a feature film to uh, really highlight what what is possible, what we can do just based off of the cumulative production experience I've had for over the past 20 years. Yeah. Do you have, we don't have to drop anything, but do you have any ideas? I do. What, what you're going to do? Are, are you excited about it? Are, and what are the steps that you have to take to get this feature film done? So just like anything, I'm, I'm learning as I go. I don't know <laughs> anything about anything. And uh, so right now I'm trying to figure out the, the whole financing. Uh, mm -hmm. part of it. But I do realize that it's not good enough for someone just to give you a check. You want to have distribution as well, because mm -hmm. you, you know, it's, it's a lot like, uh, an unsigned rapper, you know, it's just like, they may be doing something locally, but until like one of these, um, you know, Columbia or, you know, Def Jam or whatever comes along and says, we'll give you a million dollars and then we're going to pro produce it and distribute it to this wider audience. Then yeah. that's that's what I'm really looking for. So um, like Master P, Master P was great locally, but until he got that priority deal, the whole country didn't know about Master P. He had to have that distribution deal. So, I yes, for ladies and gentlemen out there in entertainment, you need that distribution. Is there a way to skip the middleman? Is there a way to learn how to distribute without going to a distributor because with technology the way it is now uh, i was interviewing uh authors and a lot of them are self-published authors um so is there a way to just forget all of that and distribute it yourself or there's they, they have a lock on on that system and you have to go through them um i i think there's a way i i think that if you are on YouTube or, you know, something, and let's just say I'm a filmmaker and I, and I, 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 I do like a streaming show and mm -hmm. people find me funny or entertaining or whatever. And I, I amass 3 million people that follow me. Mm -hmm. Then that's 3 million, that's 3 million people that will, you know, sign up for my project if I distribute it. And then maybe I just release it just, you know, via, you know, a paid site or something like that. So mm -hmm. I, I can see that as a way I can mm -hmm. also see having that type of audience would, um, encourage or, or strongly, uh, motivate distributors to come to the table saying, look, he's got, that's cause that's a, that's a lot of people. So, yeah. you know, that's, uh, you know, if, if he can get 3 million, then maybe he can get more to kind of, you know, come on to his project. So, so I think that the pro power of social media is really, uh, something that, you know, people shouldn't sleep on. I wish I was better at it. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes I get on social media and be saying wild shit. And um, I don't know if that's the way to do it. But, you know, mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do it the podcast route and TV, you know, interviews, et cetera. So it, there is definitely you can definitely build a following. Uh, if, if the content is good, you can definitely get a following. I'm somebody who is learning that process. Uh, myself. So it's definitely, I encourage you, you got the personality to do it. Uh, like, like, uh, Francis Ford Coppola said, you know, you just you got an eye for the audience. So I, you could do that. Um, tell the people where they can find you. Uh, so I'm in the process. Physically, of... Don't tell them physically where they can find you. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but just tell the people where they can find you online and your work and, and things of that nature. Yeah. Don't look for me. Yeah. <laughs> People are crazy these days. Uh, so you can find me, uh, you, you can Google me actually. Uh, I, I did a test, uh, Jason Johnson, Jason is spelled J A Y S O N Johnson, uh, 
Also, you can uh, Google Strike by Films. We're in the process of uh, rebranding my site, and that will eventually be strikebyfilms.com. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, that's that's how you can find me in the short term. But uh, you know, I'm hoping to do big things. So you know, I guess uh, I guess we'll see. All right. Jason, I want to thank you once again for coming on the show. This has been a really dope and cool conversation. And I know my audience is going to truly enjoy this and has enjoyed it, excuse me, because they've already listened to it or watched it at this point. Uh, So once again, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. I had a great time. Once again, I want to thank Jason for joining me. Uh, you guys, you know, I always say it, right? That every time I do an interview, I'm always like, that was a really interesting person. That was a really good interview. And I ain't lying. It's the absolute truth. Jason is a very interesting, entertaining person. His stories were funny and good, insightful. And the overall theme that this show produces is follow your dreams. And Jason is a clear example of a person following your dreams. I often talk about how I started this podcast. It was an idea that I had for 20 years. Finally, one day I woke up with no training, no equipment, went and bought the equipment and started it. And now you're listening and watching my show. It was all a dream. It was an idea. I follow that passion. Jason is following his passion. And in every turn, he started something new, had no idea how to do it, but he figured it out because he had a burning desire to do what he loved. If you have that desire to do what you love, don't give up. Don't start. Don't, I mean, don't stop. Don't worry about if you got it all planned out or if you actually even know what you're doing. Just start. And figure it out because the hardest thing to do is to take that first step. Once you take that first step, take that next step and the step after that, the step after that, and the steps become easier. No longer are they solely steps. You're running. You're not walking anymore. You're running and you're running towards your dream. And you might just maybe conquer your dreams, accomplish your goals, but you got to work. You got to put in the work and the effort. And Jason is a prime example of a person that does that. Do not forget to Google him, Jason Johnson. That's Jason spelled with a Y. Also, Google his film company, Strike Five Films. All of that information will be in the description. If you go to our website, you can click on his bio and get links to all of his information. Go follow him. Go watch his stuff. It's important to support people who are following their dreams and their passion. And I want all of you guys to go support Jason because I believe that he's worth supporting or else he wouldn't have been on the show, right? Uh, But anyway, thank you all for watching. Thank you all for listening. And until next time, as always, I'll holla. That was a hell of a show. Thank you for rocking with us here on Unsolicited Perspectives with Bruce Anthony. Now, before you go, don't forget to follow, subscribe, like, comment, and share our podcast wherever you're listening or watching it to it. Pass it along to your friends. If you enjoy it, that means the people that you rock with will enjoy it also. So share the wealth, share the knowledge, share the noise. And for all those people that say, well, I don't have a YouTube. If you have a Gmail account, you have a YouTube. Subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can actually watch our video podcast. But the real party is on our Patreon page, After Hours Uncensored and Talking Straight-ish. After Hours Uncensored is another show with my sister. And once again, the key word there is Uncensored. Those are exclusively on our Patreon page. Jump onto our website at unsolicitedperspective.com for all things us. That's where you can get all of our audio, video, our blog blogs and even buy our merch and if you're really feeling genuine and want to help us out you can donate on our donations page donations go strictly to improving our software and hardware so we can keep giving you guys good content that you can clearly listen to and that you can clearly see so any donation would be appreciative most importantly i want to say thank you thank you thank you for listening and watching and supporting us and i'll catch you next time audi 5000 peace